I'm going to make a very simple statement. Beer can be art. And that's not especially difficult. In fact, I think a lot of people agree with me on that point. However, where my very simple statement becomes more complicated is in what it implies. Beer can be art really means that some beer can be art. And in fact, if some beer can be art, well, that implies that some beer cannot. Now, my very simple statement has turned into a very pretentious one. In fact, at this point, I'm practically begging don't drink beer to meme the crap out of me. But it gets worse for me. See, the concept of some beer cannot be art raises a whole bunch of other clickbaity questions. And now it's beginning to sound like what I'm really asking is what makes beer craft beer? If you've spent any time on the Beer Advocate forums or on Reddit, you'll know how tiring this line of questioning gets. If you haven't already stopped this video in a huff to write, just drink what you like and quit worrying about the definition into the comments box below, then wow, thank you. <laughs> Historically speaking, beer, and any product of alcoholic fermentation, really, has been massively important to our civilization. It was a way to preserve grain harvests and sterilize drinking water for long sea voyages. But it's our cultural relationship to beer that has had the most impact on civilization. I love you, baby. In fact, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find anything so indicative of the human experience, more exemplary of emotion and passion and... and... okay. Okay, yeah, maybe you wouldn't be that hard-pressed. Rosebud. All right, enough. You're a bit skeptical, I think. Beer can't be art, it's a mass-produced food item. Well, I would argue that, yes, of course it can be. <laughs> Anything can be art, given the right context. All right, well, that was a great first episode. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you later. Beer and alcohol in general has been glorified in our society about as much as it has been vilified. But I don't think it's ever been analyzed, quite like a film or, or poetry or, well, art has been. I propose, uh, why not? Doesn't a pint of beer have a lot to say about our culture? If so, what is the rosebud of brewing? These are the kinds of questions that I hope to answer in this channel. And in doing so, maybe I'll prove this channel's raison d'etre. I'm going to make the argument that beer can be art, and defend why I think it deserves to be held to the same critical analysis as other, more traditional forms of expression. Before I can, though, there's a macro-shaped elephant in the room that I need to address. Beer is an item of mass production through and through. Even the smallest setup I'd consider viable for a startup brewery would be five barrels, which means I'd be making around 10 standard kegs of beer per brew day. If half of that goes into packaging, that's 1,200 individual 16-ounce cans with another 1,600 12-ounce pours at the bar. With that in mind, let's start at the macro end of the spectrum. Let's start with macro lagers. In order to do that, though, we need to take a trip down memory lane. In 1975, we brewed the original light beer with more taste and only 96 calories. Oh yeah, you heard that right. They just claimed they invented a style. The first light lager was actually developed by Joseph L. Owades at the now-defunct Rheingold Brewery in New York in 1967. The beer was called Gamblinger's Diet Beer, a nod to the English patron not-quite-saint of brewing Gambrinus. This diet beer was by all accounts a tremendous achievement in the brewing industry, using a never-before-heard-of process to remove calories from finished beer. If you want another sort of analogous example, talk to anybody in the brewing industry about how Left Hand bottles their nitro stout. How do they do that? It was also a tremendous marketing flop. See, the primary drinking audience back then was men, and, well, boy howdy, was a lot of masculine identity tied up in being a powerful drinker. I'm not gonna drink a diet beer, they all cried. Except, you know, they didn't cry, because men don't cry. I guess I'm just too tough to cry. Just today you were crying about snakes. They don't have any arms. Masculinity and beer advertising is like enough fodder for an entire series of these videos, so I'm gonna put a pin in that one for now. Owades shared his special technique for removing calories from beer with a friend at Chicago's Peter Hand Brewery, which later that year changed its name to the Meisterbrow Brewery before being bought by Miller. That special recipe went with them, and suddenly Miller found themselves in possession of something nobody else in the industry had, diet beer. But what to do with this marketing flop? You better have something more. Or in this case, less. And that's tricky. 
When we talk about a low calorie beer, we immediately become feminine. It's the word calorie. In 1973, the ad agency McCann Erickson developed Miller's now infamous campaign, Great Taste, Less Filling. And it really tastes great. Whitey, if we'd had a great tasting beer that was less filling in the old days, can you imagine where we'd be now? Yeah, the beer drink is Hall of Fame. That calls for another light beer from Miller. Make it two. Three, four. It's a good thing life's less filling. In the coming years, that beer became incredibly popular, thanks in large part to some of these ads featuring outlandish characters like Rodney Dangerfield. I won't be long, girls. Hold my calls, will you? <laughs> it hit the weather vane! It's in the drain! Here it comes out! And suddenly, it seemed like every brewing entity in the United States needed to create their own version of a light lager just to keep relevant. Does that sound familiar to any IPA fans out there? Hmm? Even though this style was technologically impressive, it wasn't actually that transgressive of an idea. Breweries around the world had been chasing lighter, cleaner, and more shelf-stable beers since, well, the first Pilsner started coming out of Pilsen in the 1800s. There was nothing especially transgressive about either brewing or drinking light lager. It all came down to marketing. Great taste, less filling, made the new style of American light adjunct lager ubiquitous and normal. And now to the point of all of this. Are light lagers artistic? Well, as hard as it is to define art, I do believe that art needs to make you pause. It needs to make you consider what you're experiencing. I mean, even John Gage's 433, a full orchestral arrangement with zero actual music being played in it, forces you to engage with it. Light lagers? Well... They're kind of the lowest common denominator version of beer. I mean, don't get me wrong, a nice ice-cold light lager is really refreshing under certain circumstances, and sure, I'll reach for one when the time is right, but that time is right when I don't want to actually think about what I'm drinking. I just would want something cold that does not need to be analyzed. It just is refreshing. That's basically the only purpose. I believe that the experience of drinking is one of the most important aspects when considering a beer's inherent artsiness. Because that's how you interact with the beer. You smell it, you taste it, you, you get drunk off of it and send embarrassing texts about hop varieties to your ex. Baby, just come back. Don't you love Willamette? I love Willamette too. <laughs> so enough about light beer. What about heavy beer? What about bitter beer? What about craft beer? Craft beer certainly seems like the perfect counterpoint in this can beer be art debate. They have a focus on full flavors with a connection to locality and sourcing of quality ingredients. They push the envelope and make us want to leave our comfort zones. How many of you got into craft beer in general because of a bold claim on a Stone Brewing Company label? It's not expensive, you're just cheap, might be the great taste less filling of craft beer. That's another video entirely, not, not getting into it here. There are currently thousands of small, independent craft breweries across the United States making stylistically adventurous, delicious beers. We'll wait in line for hours just to get a four-pack of some 16-ounce milkshake hazy IPA. Ugh. Oh, man, New England IPAs. Mm. Gotta get them fresh. Gotta drink them within a week. Oh, man. Uh. There are even specific instances where some of these breweries have made artistically expressive beers. As a final gesture to their fallen friend, the boys at BrewDog had the beer immortalized in the body of the martyred Mr. Stoat. This is beer meat sire. This is designed to push the boundary and to upset conventional wisdom. We've now reached the lunatic fringe of brewing. We've reached Samuel Adams' Utopias. This is a unique beer. There is literally nothing like it in the world. These beers exist based on definition from their brewers as artistic expressions. They challenge us. They defy expectations of what beer tastes like, of what packaging should be. I mean, like that Omnipolo label is straight up offensive. I mean, blah, blah. Through their extremely limited release, they've also achieved extremely high dollar amounts attached to the secondary and auction markets. Now granted, high price alone should not dictate what is and what is not considered art. Artistic value versus artistic quality is a huge debate that's been raging since, well, art existed ever. For now, let's just assume that these beers exist on a different level than most commercially available drinking products, even apart from most craft beer. When they're up on that shelf, they really are art. So what about the rest of the IPAs, the stouts, the saisons, the lagers, the porters, the barley wines, the everything of the craft beer universe right now. 
Whether you listen to the Brewers Association definition or not, the collective definition, that is to say, what we all decide craft beer is, is changing. And it's completely subjective, depending on who you ask, and what time you ask them, and what forum you're a part of at any given time, especially when you take into consideration how breweries are financed, and what it's called when a formerly small brewery is suddenly acquired by a large brewing entity or private equity firm. In the music industry, longtime fans of small indie bands would call this selling out, trading a band's artistry for a paycheck. Ask any old-school Modest Mouse fan what they think of good news for people who love bad news, and you'll see exactly what I mean. Lonesome Crowded West was the greatest album of all time, and good news for people who love bad news is pop trash, meh. Of course, the band can come back and say that access to better studio equipment and better producers allows them to create their art better. At the end of the day, though, the motivation for creation matters. See, those producers get paid more when the band makes better art art. See where I'm going with this? Look at the world of high-end cooking as well. There are some people who would argue that high-end chefs are considered artists, likening their performance in the kitchen every night to a Broadway performance. Chefs have to answer to investors though, and in order to run a successful, <coughs> profitable restaurant, the dishes they create cannot be so transgressive as to turn away customers. Do these pair well with an IPA? It goes well with all letters. IPA, CSI, PTA, IRS. The food they create has to transcend the human experience of simply eating. But is food served at a restaurant not enough to drive patrons away from buying and consuming a plate? It's made with black garlic. Uh, it's a fermented garlic. It comes from Korea. Don't blame Korea for your stupid burger, Bob. Whether it's a hot dog or a 28-day dry-aged steak, it has to be consumed to fulfill its purpose as food. A painting is consumed once you look at it, but the act of consumption does not destroy it. It remains on the wall. The steak and the hot dog are both food, but what is undeniable about the two is that they are different. See, they both objectively have the same value as pieces of food that we have to eat in order to be sustained. However, subjectively, they both have extremely different qualities. If all we as humans needed out of the eating experience was sustenance, we'd always seek out the cheapest and lowest common denominator version of it and get on with our day. Obviously, we don't do that, or at least we try not to. We go out and eat at fancy restaurants and spend time cooking lavish meals at home for a reason. We choose to drink craft beer for a reason. So is that growler of double IPA you waited all day in line for considered art? What about the six month bourbon barrel aged barley wine? What about the beer served in a dead squirrel? What about the can of light lager from the gas station? Before we finally answer the question, can beer be considered art? Let's take a look at one final example. Film is an artistically expressive medium and within that medium are works that are absolutely considered fine art. But not all movies are the same artistically. Wherever you fall on the artistic value versus quality debate, it's pretty clear that Citizen Kane is not the same as Transformers. I am directly below! Enemy scrotum! One is a steak, the other is a hot dog. Despite those differences though, there exist critical in-depth analyses of both works. I would argue that brewing, whether for the mass market or for niche craft audiences, is an artistically expressive medium. You can drink ales right now that replicate what was available in ancient Mesopotamia, connecting you to a specific time in human history. You can drink coffee beer, sour beer, beer brewed by ordained monks. You can drink one of the classic pilsners, brewed exactly now as it was in the 1800s, in the same tasting flight as an IPA made with experimental hop varieties that were grown like two years ago. The brewing medium provides a vehicle for artistic expression that can evoke emotion, transcend the human experience of drinking, and provide, even transgress, culture itself. Your choice of what to drink, regardless of what beer it actually is, can be just as expressive as choosing to enjoy other, more traditional, mediums. With one caveat. At the end of the day, you have to drink your beer in order to fully appreciate it. In that sense, I guess you can have your art and drink it too. This has been The Bar Exam, and I'm Andrew Hoffman. Cheers. One and done! Woo! One take Andy, more like 8,000 take Andy, huh? <laughs>